that my kids didn't come until I was 38, four kids in that seven year period. Um, and I didn't get married till I was 35. So my fatherhood phase came in a little later in life where you can make an argument that's better because you may be a little bit more financially stable. You have your career organized. The other part that's the negative is, is that you're still doing fatherhood stuff. I got a kid in high school, so I can't go anywhere when I'm in my 60s. So there's two ways to look at it. You know, being a fatherhood with young kids is a young man's deal. And so maybe 35 is a, or 39 might be a little late to get started there. So maybe in the late 20s would have been better, but it is what it is. So um, I'm still doing and, you know, still don't have everybody out of the house yet. At this point in my life, the last one's still sitting there and a junior in high school. And so from the ages of 38 to 63, 64, I've had kids around here in New Canaan, Connecticut. What's doing, everybody? Welcome to First Class Fatherhood. I'm Alec Lace. And before I hit you with today's interview, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit the link in the description so you can listen to all of the interviews I've done with so many tremendous dads, including Dana White, Deion Sanders, Tony Hawk, and so many others. Now let's get going with today's interview. Uh, joining me now, First Class Father, Chris Mad Dog Russo. Welcome to First Class Fatherhood. Alec, good to be on, buddy. How you doing today, okay? What's happening? I'm doing well. Listen, it's an honor to have you here. I've been a long-time listener. I've called you quite a few times over the years, so it's an honor to have you on the podcast. Let's just start it like this. How many kids do you have, and how old are they? Uh, I have four kids, uh, three boys and a girl. The ages, the youngest is 16. He just turned it, and the oldest is 22. So my wife had four kids in seven years, one out of college, two in, one at home, three boys and a girl. Yeah, well, I'm right there with you. I got three boys and a girl myself. Our girl is the youngest. We got her on the final try. If not, we'd have five, but we got her on four, and that was the end of that. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, you know, sometimes you, you can't worry about what you're going to get, because if you do that, you might end up with 11 boys and no girls. You know, <laughs> people, so you don't, you don't worry about that. But I'm glad I had the boy and a the girl. They were the first two, boy first, girl second. And I'm glad it worked out that way. Yeah, very cool. If you could, Chris, please just take one minute here to hit my listeners with a little bit about your background and what you do. Sure. I'm a talk show host, uh, Alec, on WFAN in New York for a long, long period of time, 19 19- uh, 87, 88, uh, right up into Mike and the Mad Dog, which is a afternoon drive show, which uh, began in 89. And I did that up into 2008. And then from 2008 to currently, I've been over here at uh, Sirius XM on Channel 82, Mad Dog Radio. And we've been doing afternoon drive sports uh, since 2008. So 19 years at FAM and now around 13 or so here at Sirius XM. So, you know, 32 years talking sports in the New York market for the most part. Yeah, you, you've had a legendary career for sure, Chris. So if you could take me back to the beginning now of your fatherhood journey here, about how old were you when you first became a dad and how did becoming a father kind of change your perspective on life? Yeah, I was 38 when I had my first, uh, was I even older than that? Uh, eight, 90, I was 39 when I had my first, when my wife had her uh, first child, that which was December of 98. I was married in May of 95. So three years after um, I was married, uh, Timmy came along. And I was 35 when I got married, 39 when Tim came. And my last child was born in July of 2005. And I was 45. No, I'm sorry. I, I was 45 going on 46. So I, I uh, my kids didn't come until I was 38. Four kids in that seven year period. Um, and I didn't get married till I was 35. So my childhood, my fatherhood phase came in a little later in life where you can make an argument that's better because you may be a little bit more financially stable. You have your career organized. The other part that's the negative is, is that you're still doing fatherhood stuff. I got a kid in high school, so I can't go anywhere when I'm in my 60s. So there's two ways to look at it. You know, being a father with young kids is a young man's deal. And so maybe 35 is a, or 39 might be a little late to get started there. So maybe in the late 20s would have been better, but it is what it is. So um, I'm still doing and, you know, still don't have everybody out of the house yet at this point in my life. The last one's still sitting there and a junior in high school. And so from the ages of 38 to 63, 64, I've had kids around here in New Canaan, Connecticut. 
Yeah, very cool. And Chris, yeah, my father was 50 years old when he had me. So uh, he was born in 1930. He grew up in a completely different era. And one of the things that I know with you, I know you're big with the old movies. I grew up, my father was actually a stand-in singer for Eddie Fisher back in the 50s. So I grew up watching all them, Humphrey Bogart, Jimmy Cagney movies. I know you're a big African queen guy. Did you kind of, and one of the things I love is introducing those movies to my kids, especially now the month of October, I bring them all the universal horror movies. Do you share, do your kids get involved in watching those movies? Did Did you share that with your kids? As much as I possibly can. My one boy, uh, third youngest, he is he is really into it. Uh, he's seen High Noon. They've all seen Shawshank Redemption, but he's seen High Noon. He's seen a lot of the old time classics. He is the most interested in that, more so than the other two. My daughter is studying film at Notre Dame, so she is now getting into the old classics. So she's jumping on board some now. Uh, but the one who I spent the most time with from an old movie perspective would be my sophomore at Wisconsin, and he's into it. Um, you know, he knows who Gary Cooper is. He's heard of Humphrey Bogart. They, they all love the movies. You know, kids love the movies. My youngest is a big horror movie fan, which I'm not crazy about, but, uh, you know, there isn't a scary movie he doesn't like. And right now they all want to do the movies. I mean, you know, which is we all know how hard that is to break into the movie business, whether it's in front or behind the camera. Uh, But um, yes, movies, big part of my life too, growing up, talked a lot about them with my old partner forever. And uh, I tried to introduce my kids to as many movies as I can. The one that they all saw that I made sure they did see was Shawshank Redemption. That is one I made sure they saw. (laughs) All right, good stuff. And then how about uh, as far as values, Chris, what would you consider to be the top values that you hope to instill in all your kids growing up? Hmm, that's a good one. Well, everybody's treated equally, number one. I think that, and that's why I like sports so much, because, you know, you're cut a blind. It doesn't make any difference who the players are, black, white, um, Asian makes no difference. You're all out there to try to win. So I make sure they all know that, and following sports helps there. Uh, that's the first thing. Second thing is, is that, you know, honest days work, honest days pay. Go out there and You know, nothing is going to be accomplished without some modicum of hard work. So I try to make sure that they know that. And sometimes it goes in one ear and out the other. Sometimes I think it might register. You know, you you don't want to overdo it because when you overdo it, then they're going to sort of rebel against you and not pay attention. You know how kids are. I was the same way with my father. I didn't want to listen to Joe DiMaggio stories all day. So I kind of turned I turned the other cheek, so to speak. And I'm, a, I'm so I'm conscious of my kids doing the same to me if I overdo it. But, uh, you know, I try to lead in a lot of ways. I try to lead by example. If they see me working hard, if they see me treating everybody equally, if they see me, you know, uh, work, uh, get, getting on a train every morning to go to work. If they see me, you know, going to church on Sunday afternoons or a synagogue, if that would be the case or Sunday mornings, I, I hopefully that rubs off. So I, I try to lead by example as much as I possibly can. Yeah, very well said, Chris. And, and then I, and leaning into that a little bit more, what about as far as discipline goes? What, what type of disciplinarian are you as a dad? And is that different than the discipline style you grew up with? Yeah, I'm, I'm not a good disciplinarian. My wife's much <laughs> better at that than I am. Uh, I am not. Uh, I have a tendency to forget about why I'm mad about an hour later. So I might say, you know, you're not driving the car. You're going to be grounded. You're going to be this. You're going to be that. And then an hour later, I, I, I change my mind. I forget. Um, my the one kid who's the one who follows me who's like me he's a pain in the neck stays out late a lot in the summertime so I'm always up waiting for him to get home he drives me crazy but even trying to be mad at him it doesn't last as long as it should because I I know uh, I forget about it or I don't want to be the bad guy there in a relationship so I sort of let my wife be the bad cop to my good cop so from a disciplinary standpoint my wife takes care of that you know, and again, you know, I don't discipline them too much. Fortunately, we haven't really had to do that that much. I got good kids. Um, but there are times everybody steps over the line that you got to be paying attention to their behavior. And you got to essentially once in a while lower the boom. So are we, it's not like I've avoided it. But when I have to do something, I let my wife take care of it. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I, I definitely am, am getting better at my discipline with my daughter. I'm, I'm definitely a little bit better at it with my my boys than I am with my girl. She's my youngest. She's only seven. So I'm, I'm still kind of learning the game there with her. Right. 
Right. And, 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 and obviously, you know, sports, big part of your life. What kind of sports did your kids play growing up? And did you ever get a chance to uh, coach them into sports? Or did you ever step away from that and watch it from the sidelines? No, I just watched. Uh, I did not coach them. Uh, they played basketball mostly. My oldest was ran, and, ran track and field, too. But basically basketball. Uh, I made sure I got in all the games. Uh, I made sure that I showed up at all the games. You know, I was completely into it. And uh, I would maneuver every way I could to... Uh, uh, if the game was in an inconvenient time to get to the game and tape something so I could without being diligent, without being, you know, uh, a detriment to the radio. Uh, so I, I was I went to all these AAU tournaments for day, a weekend day after weekend. I was pretty good. Um, uh, I took it seriously, probably more seriously than they did. Um, I tried not to hide disappointment when your kids didn't play as well as you think they sh- you think they should have where I thought the effort wasn't great. You know, I tried to keep my mouth shut and not say anything because that's going to have a bad consequence too. Um, uh, and, you know, when they played well, I made sure I told them, you know, and I didn't always equate it with points. You know, I am I can analyze a ball game uh, with the best of them. So when I see a basketball game and I think they played well, but it doesn't include any baskets, uh, you know, that's not important to me. Sure, everybody wants to score. And I think when you see – basketball being played at a high school level or an AAU level. Everybody looks at the points. I looked at it from a little different standpoint. Um, and I was, and I, I was good with it. Uh, you know, my youngest doesn't play sports. So he, I haven't had the pleasure of dealing with, with that. My daughter played a little soccer. Then she got away from it. It's the two boys. They both played basketball, both played on the varsity, went to a million games, um, was friends with the coach before he coached them. So that uh, at times, you know, was a little problematic because, you know, high school coaches don't want to be dealing with parents because it's all about playing time. But overall, I think, uh, you know, I handled their uh, careers pretty good. Uh, I was supportive, went to a lot of the games and um, made sure they played, which is the most important thing. Did something. Yeah. And then getting it in, into here, into what you do, Chris, I know you mentioned there some of your kids wanted to get into in front of the camera, whether it be acting or behind the camera. It's a d- difficult field to get into. So is broadcasting and what you've been doing. A lot of people are uh, trying to get in. I know the podcasting has changed the game completely since when you came first on the scene here. So what, what kind of advice do you have for the parents out there who have kids that are interested in a broadcast uh, sports analysis uh, type of career that you got? How would you tell the parents? to steal Very kids? difficult. First thing I would say, you know, go to college. I would go to a liberal arts college, made sure the college had a radio station, worked in the college radio station doing a variety of things, and then see if you like it when you graduate, when you're 22 years of age. I, the way I did it, and it's the only way I know, you know, I went to a small station in Jacksonville, Florida, and I went, um, you know, and I worked my way up the ladder through that way, Orlando next, and then I got lucky in New York. Uh, I know that's not necessarily the way to go today. Because there's so many different outlets, as you said, with podcasting. Podcasts can get lost. You know, there's so many podcasts out there. And it's not really radio. It's a, you know, it's a different thing. So I don't know if I'd recommend that. I would recommend doing it the old-fashioned way and getting on a radio station and doing your thing. Or if TV is it, do the television as well. Uh, that's the way I did it. I don't think there's any shortcuts. Um, I think you got to get as much experience as you can. The college radio... Don't confuse that with uh, commercial radio because it's not. It's just something to do. Practice it. Get a sense if you can do this. And then once you graduate college, you go into a – it's a whole new ball game there in commercial radio. I know I went to Jacksonville to get started. Um, they had to go to Racine, Wisconsin. Go to Racine, Wisconsin. I have one who wants to do it. Um, he's, you know, he's got ability. He's only a sophomore in college. He's done everything in college that you would – think a kid should do, whether it's pre or pregame or halftime or hosting for the college radio station. So I think he's kind of on the right path. We'll see what happens in five years because there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of bumps in the road with this field. But, you know, again, if this is different because, you know, you can, if you know something about finance, you can get yourself organized. If you know something about journalism, you're going to find a newspaper to write on. You know, if you don't have a great voice and if you don't have that personality and if you're not magnetic, 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 don't have great presence, there's no guarantee you're going to make it on uh, in the media, in radio or television. 
you got to have presence. And that's something you can't teach. You either have it or you don't. Um, and, you know, I would never tell somebody to forego their dreams if they thought they could do this. And But, uh, but you know, it's a knack. It's not really something you refine it. But you can tell early on whether somebody has that little something extra that makes him, you know, a radio or a TV or a podcast celebrity, quote unquote. You can tell that early. It's it's I, I don't think you're going to all of a sudden walk into a radio station at 23, be awful. And then all of a sudden turn out to be Vin Scully at 33. Now, yeah. there's got to be certain ingredients that you got to have going in that you can tell right away if you have it. And, you know, in my case with the one, we'll see, uh, I see some of that, you know, but there's more to it than that. But you got to have that. I see some of that in him. We'll see what happens down the road. Yeah, great take, Chris. I know the field is large and the availability is minimum, so I know it's a it's a struggle for a lot of people to get into it. And and I wanted to ask you, too, I have the four kids like you, and I, now your job, obviously, not just the actual talk radio, but it's watching the games, doing the research and stuff like that. And one of the things that I, I don't say struggle with, but it's challenging, is to spend one-on-one -on -one time with each one of my four kids because I know how important it is for them. How have you been able to manage that with your four kids, considering the job that you have? Have you been able to get isolated one-on-one -on -one time with them? How do you kind of handle that? Well, I mean, the two boys, the older boys, definitely, because we went to all the basketball tournaments on weekends together at the AAU. Drove, you know, whether, wherever, wherever they might be, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island. So I always spend time with them. Uh, the daughter and I have a very good relationship. She's not into sports, but she's a lot like me. She's very well organized. Uh, she's got a goal that she wants, and she's got a plan of how to get there. Um, you know, she's got a mind of her own. So if you try too hard to coerce her into doing what you think you want her to do instead of what she wants her to do, what she wants herself to do, you're going nowhere. You're hitting your head against the wall. So you almost got to guide her gently. And I've learned how to do that. My 16 year old, I have some trouble with because, you know, he's not into I'm, I'm finding things to bond with him. You know, he's not a sports fan. He's not going to sit there and listen to Crosby, Stills, and Nash. You know, my oldest loves Springsteen, so I always had that with him too. This 16-year-old doesn't have that. So more issues with the 16-year-old finding a common ground than the other three. So I, uh, three, you know, we got four kids. You know, not all of them are going to be you're going to have a peachy relationship with. There's always going to be some issues with one or maybe more. With me, it's the one that, you know. Uh, we love each other, but you can tell there's some friction. There's not a lot in common. Commonality is the most important thing. I have commonality, commonality with the two boys, whether it's sports, basketball, broadcasting, teams. The daughter, very much like me. So I have some of that with her. The boy, the youngest one, not as much. So that's the one. Yeah, and one of the things about being a dad too, Chris, is like my oldest became into. I always talk about he became interested in chess at an early age. It's something I never knew anything about, but it was something that I, I learned to do to, to play with him. And now I love the game. We all play as a family and stuff, and it's something I never would have ever imagined myself exactly. doing in my life. So they introduce right. us to kind of some of these things too to help Absolutely us grow. Right. Uh, my my youngest plays some chess. I like to see him uh, join a chess club, uh, and you know to really refine all the rules and everything else. And I would do it with him, but. Yeah, he is. Um, yeah, he, he played chess, too. My, my other ones don't. I try to teach him how to play backgammon, things like that. Um, but again, you know, with, 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 with the young kid, with the kids, you try to find co commonality and identify to them on their level. I mean, that's how you try to handle that. And the 16 year old is the one that I haven't done a great job with so far of finding that common ground. Yeah. All right. And obviously you're still crushing it on the radio here with the mad dog. What, 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 how much longer are you planning on doing this? And what, what kind of plans or goals do you have for yourself in the future? Well, remember, I got a kid still in high school, so I'm not going to stop doing it until he's at least in college and at least two years away from probably thinking about doing that. Um, you know, I still love talking and I still love breaking down sports. So until that leaves me, I don't see why I wouldn't want to still do this in some capacity. Maybe you tone it down a little bit and don't do three jobs, podcast, television, and radio shows. So maybe you eliminate one or two of those along the way. But until the youngest leaves, you know, and you know, gets himself organized with what he wants to do and is sort of on safe ground, I would think that I would be in the mix. Plus the fact that I want to be in the mix right now. I got a kid who wants to be a basketball coach and another one who might be want to be a talk show host. So I want to be in the, in the medium 
when they find me a way so I can help them. You know, if I disappear for five years and all of a sudden I pick up a phone and call WHAS in Louisville, you know, they may not know who I am. So I, I keep that in mind too. As long as I am relevant, that will help them in getting their career started in tricky careers, as you said, coaching, sports, and if he wants to be a broadcaster in some capacity, that as well. Yeah, makes sense, Chris. And, and the last thing I want to hit you with here, I'd love to ask all the dads that I get on a podcast, what type of advice do you have for that new dad or for that about-to-be father who's out there listening? Wow. Uh, well, first off, the first thing is small kids, small problems, big kids, big problems. Uh, that's the first thing. You know, big kids, you know, driving, uh, going out when they become teenagers. I mean, you really got to have a lot of patience. You got to give them a little room. Uh, as well, there's a fine line there too. Room doesn't mean four o'clock in the morning. Nothing good happens after 2 a.m. Uh, with the small kids, I mean, you got to be patient. You know, there's a lot of, uh, that's why it's a young man's deal. You know, you got, you know, there's a lot of making sure this, that stuff that is, you know, diapers, infancy, giving your wife a break, all those little things. It's tricky when you're young because it's very time consuming. When they get older, they're more into their own thing. And so you can really leave them alone. You got to check up on them because you don't want to get them and you don't want them getting involved in things that you, they shouldn't be getting involved in. And, you know, their kids are secretive. You know, they hang out in their rooms, look at their computers all day. Who knows what they're looking at? So you have to keep that in mind, too. You got to have some sort of parental uh, supervision there. But, you know, you try to give your kids some room because, you know, you're not going to be here forever. And when they get to a certain age, you can't do anything with them anyway. And you know, once they get to be 21, they're on their own. And you want to be able to set them on the right course and have them trust you. And I think if you give them some room so they can fall on their, fall on their own occasionally when they get to be teenagers, finding that fine line of when I should get involved, when they got to fend for themselves. I think that's a tricky thing to do as, as far as fatherhood is, and parenthood is concerned. Yeah, very well said. I love the message. This has been an honor for me. I got to say, Chris Russo, you're a first-class father all the way. And thank you so much for giving me a few minutes of your time here on First Class Fatherhood. Alec, great job for you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it here today.